a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I had a completely different message prepared, and I was like, okay, this is going to like blow their minds, and this will be, oh, yeah, whatever. See, like I said, it was going to be that good. Stuff was going to fall off the building. It was going to be so amazing. I was prepared for that. And then all of a sudden, then God, like, out of nowhere, like, hits me with this thunderbolt last week and was like, nah, bro, like, you're going to teach on this. And it was just like, Pfft. and I was like, okay. And ever since then, I just, I've been like this weird spot of just wanting to be in God's presence and, like, yearning for him, like, all the time, and it's been fantastic. Don't get me wrong. It's been so great. But one thing I started doing, I think that's helping, and I want to share this with you because this is, I think, really important for us to know because we talked about over the summer in our fall in our uh, Soul Detox series, if you were here for that, um, we talked about how we're all preachers and how we're all preaching and teaching somebody, whether it's just ourselves or it's others around us, and we're all preaching something. And so what I've actually done is I've written up kind of a, a mantra, or a, you know, I man it up like a war cry, right? Where it's like, I mean, I write it down, and then I read it every morning. So every morning I wake up, and I read this war cry to, kind of to myself. And, you know, I mean, sometimes out loud, and my neighbors think I'm weird, because it's like, yeah, like, it's like, yeah, it's so good. But then other times it's just myself. But I read it to myself every day, and some of the things that are on it, there's just simple bullet points, but some of the things that are on it are things like this. The first one I know I have is, it's, I live to serve Jesus Christ. It's my first bullet. My second bullet is, I love my wife, and I would lay down my life for hers. You can say, aw, it's okay. So that's my second one. Then my third one is, I'm going to inspire and equip my children to live six, eight lives by doing that myself. That's my third one. And I've got a couple other ones that are like that. I mean, just simple bullet points. One of my favorite ones, though, is this right here. It's, today, the world is going to be different because I live for Jesus. So those are the kinds of things that I wake up and I just kind of read that to myself. And it, like ever since then, like the two weeks that I've started doing that, every morning I wake up and it's like, yeah, like let's just, like it's again, it's this war cry. It's like, let's get going. Like, yeah, this is awesome. And so this, this morning I've, I've entitled this, this message, receive, everybody say receive. receive. Mm, that's gonna, okay, that's our foundation. We gotta get, so that's where we are we got to get up to here, okay, just letting you know, okay, so everybody say receive. receive, there we go, receive in confidence, and I want to ask you this morning, this evening, whatever time it is, today, if you're in this room, I want to ask you if you've lost confidence in God, have you lost confidence in God, have you lost confidence that he's going to deliver Confidence that his word is true. Confidence that above all else you are loved and, be and beloved by, by the most high God in the most incredible way possible. But have you lost confidence in that? Have you lost confidence that the gates of hell are not going to prevail? I love the illustration. I shared this with you over the summer that um, Larry Osborne has when it comes to the church going up against hell that we can actually attack it with a squirt gun and we're going to win. Like that's, I mean, yeah, when God's on our side, we can attack hell with a squirt gun, and guess what? We're going to prevail. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against God's church. Or have you lost sight of that fact? Have you lost confidence in that fact? And you look at the world around you and you just think, it's taken over. And when you look at the world in a global sense, you can see some pretty rough stuff, absolutely. Absolutely. And this Sunday is actually an IJM or an international justice mission there, what they call a Freedom Sunday. So what that is, they send out, um, you know, statistics and, you know, read, you know, reading materials and whatever else to churches and people to basically make them aware of the amount of slavery that's still in the world today. So if you're a stat person like myself, you know, I love watching sports, whatever, and like hooking up stats and doing fanny stuff, these are for you. If you don't like stats, they're for you anyway. So we're going to go through them. A couple of things. There's 45 million people bound in slavery today. One in four of those people are children. There's 11.6 million people that are in the clutches of sex trafficking. And four billion, that's with a B, people live outside of the protection of the law. So four billion people live in an area where there's really no law to govern the land and so kind of everything goes and it's a little bit of anarchy. 
There's obvious prejudice. Cops are being gunned down in the states. There was just a shooting um, in Burlington, Washington just yesterday. Right? Drug wars are continuing to rise. There are new warlords and dictators popping up all over the world. Guys, the world is spinning. Or so it would seem. Because turn to your neighbor and say, but wait. Turn to your neighbor, but wait. Because as Steve reminded us last week, that's only one side of the story. Humans only look at history and we only can see what we can see. There's an entire other section over here, the, the, the part of the story where God has actually woven himself into the very fabrics of history to change the things that are going on, to be influenced on things that are going on because God has say. So yes, we can see all this stuff over here and it's like, oh, it's kind of a bummer. But over here, there's a God who's still working, who's still in charge and is going to see it through. In Uganda, China, Africa, and other parts of the world, there is such fierce persecution for the gospel going on right now. It's not something that we're reading about in history books. It's happening right here, right now. There's fierce persecution against the word of God. Why? Why? This kind of came to me this last week. Where I was like, why? Why is there so much persecution? Like, why do people want to seem to like go after the gospel message of all other religions, of all other people groups? Why Christianity? Why the gospel message? Because God's word has power. Amen? God's word has power. And so follow me here, because as humanity seeks its own power, what scares the ever-living daylights out of somebody seeking power? What is it? It's ultimate power. And so you can't control people who believe in an ultimate power because you're trying to like create for yourself this own little kingdom with your own little powers and blah, 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 blah. But you can't control those people who look beyond your power to the ultimate source of power. And so what do you have to do? You have to go and you have to kill, you have to destroy, you have to humiliate all those who believe in the ultimate power. So it makes total sense. Because God brings hope to the hopeless and rescue to the slave. Can I get an amen? amen. There we go. And then, now this is the part of the message where we start getting a little more rowdy. I'm warning you. Okay, this week and next week, I'm here next week too. So if you're thinking, why wow, this guy's nuts, I'm not the normal guy, I'm the youth guy. So send your kids to me and we'll, like, we'll get all hyped up in here. It'll be amazing. But guess what? It's time to get a little rowdy because you know what? Guys, God is on the move. God is on the move in Ephesians chapter three. I love some of the stuff that Paul writes to the churches and this one in Ephesus. Starting in chapter three, verse seven, it says this. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone, what is the plan for the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So that through the church, everybody say church. church. Oh, come on, everybody say church. Because that's you, right? That's you, that's me. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Everybody say confidence. confidence. Now say it with confidence. confidence. There we go. Through our faith in him. So do not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Church, we gotta have confidence when we approach the throne. We gotta have confidence in our God. We have to have confidence that he is gonna see it through. We have to have confidence that when he says he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. And we have to have confidence that when we're gonna suffer for our faith because it's promised that we are, right? It shouldn't be a surprise when suffering comes. We're gonna talk a little about that next week. It shouldn't be a surprise. And it's so that through the church, God's glory, not our own glory, but God's glory could be known throughout the world. See, we're not, we're not searching after our own glory. We're not, and if we are, shut us down. Uh, from up here, I'm saying it. If we're, searching our, if we're searching after our own glory, trying to build SBC to be like the worldwide church of religion and all that it is, and it's like, we are the end all, shut it down. Close the doors. No, it's not about our glory. It's about his glory. And that is so just beautifully put in Romans chapter five. So if you're in it, 
Ephesians, go back a little bit to Romans chapter 5, where um, Paul is saying this to the, the church in Rome. Therefore, oh, see, I love that. Whenever you start, whenever you start a passage with the word therefore, it's kind of like this, like, oh, like, oh, here we go, like, here it goes, like, like, come on, Paul, like, bring it on, buddy, like, what do you got? Like, this, it's gonna blow our minds, because that word, like, therefore, and it's almost like a cliffhanger, it's like, come on, buddy, what do you got? Well, here's what he's got. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice, everybody say rejoice. rejoice. There you go, in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice, everybody say rejoice. rejoice. Come on, there you go. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out on the hearts of the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Can I get a little bit of noise for that passage? Like, man, God's word is incredible. That is so amazing that God would do that and send his son so we have access to that. That's amazing. Because I love sharing good news. That's why I love my job. I don't know if you can tell, but I love my job. Like, come on, like this is so good. Because you know what, you can, you can watch and listen like, you know, about all the depressing stuff you want. You know what, that's what the news is for, okay? You can go and if you're like, man, I'm feeling too happy today. I wanna get depressed. Go watch the news. Don't come to church, okay? Like, because we have the good news and so I love sharing good news with you and here's some that you may not expect. <laughs> People, the church is not dead. Can I say it again? The church is not dead. The church is not dead dead. And guess what? The church isn't even dying like we think it's dying. Like, don't get me wrong. In North America and Europe, the, the, the growth is like, oh, so painfully slow. Like, it's like, oh, like, come on, man. Like, just get, it's painfully slow. I'll give it to you. It's painfully slow. But the rest of the world, <laughs> the enemy better have some diapers ready because here are some more stats for you stat people. Here we go. Uganda, under intense persecution, is growing, this is true, is growing so exponentially, it's growing so rapidly that I couldn't even get a, like, realistic, practical, like, I couldn't put a finger on the statistic of how many people are following Jesus. Because as soon as they put it up on the website, it's no longer, it, it's out of date. It's too big. They've already grown again. Like, it's like they put a number down. It's like, well, we got to change it. I mean, it have to be like a live stream on Facebook of just numbers going because they're growing so crazy. That's awesome. In China, they're building a larger underground church than has ever been seen before in history. That's crazy. There's a church, I don't know if you know this, there's a church in Seoul, South Korea. And I love, because who's their neighbors, right? Like who's, who's like South Korea's neighbors? Oh, North Korea, awkward. But that's God's sense of humor. Like seriously, this is God's sense of humor because the largest church in the world is in Seoul, South Korea, right next door to North Korea. Ha, you're adorable. But here you go, here's the stat for you. You ready for this? Seoul, South Korea has 480,000 members. Not just people that go to their church. Like, you got over a half million easy, like just going to church. 480,000 members. That is crazy big. Like, we're all like, man, we are making some strides and we're growing. Yeah, okay. Almost a half million members in a single church. That's crazy. This one, this next stat, this messed me up. I, I, I've been telling people this stat all week long. I told my youth this stat. This one messed me up. The church in Africa has seen a 52% growth rate over the last 15 years. Now hold on, wait for it. That's not even the crazy part. Let me go a step deeper. That means that there is an average of about 33,000 people being saved or born into a Christian home every single day. 
Why are we not freaking out? Every single day, 33,000 people are being saved. Like, again, why are we not making noise? Like, that should be like, come on. Because God's not just working here. He's working around the world. We have to broaden our scope. We have to broaden our scope. It can't just be about what we're doing here. We have to look and see what God is doing in the church, big C. And so we thought Pentecost was a big deal. When Peter gave his message, it was like, boom, 3,000 people, what up? And so so many, so many churches are like, oh, in one day, I want 3,000 people. Africa's like, okay, fine, we'll do 33,000 in one day, and that's our average. Like, step your game up, Peter, come on. Like, that's amazing, that's amazing, so good. Over this last weekend, Elevation Church in North Carolina is called the fastest growing church in American history had their Code Orange Revival. I mean, they're all like hipster and like cool church. They had to call it like their Code Orange Revival. I don't even know what it means, but it's, it's okay, their Code Orange Revival. And they had tens of thousands of people in attendance. Almost 100,000 people were actually at the conference physically. Thousands of people were baptized over the 10-day conference. And they had over a half million people either looking in online, watching the podcast, inter like interacting, because they had all kinds of interactive stuff that was going. So over a half million people experienced this revival around the globe. That's amazing. The church isn't dead. And then you're like, well, that's great. But Kenny, you're talking about like other countries and you're talking about like the States, gross, you're from there, like doesn't count. <laughs> Sorry. You're like, what about us? Okay, let's go to our borders. Ah, see how I said that? Our borders. <laughs> so we go to our borders. Right across, I mean, the ferry ride over. A ferry ride over, right there in Vancouver, you have the Village Church, which is absolutely exploding the city of Vancouver. Last week alone, they had 70 baptisms. Last week alone, they had 70. That's, guys, that's right in our backyard. That's amazing. So my question is, why not us? Why not us? And some of you are like, well, that's great. Yeah, it's all them. But you don't think we have something to celebrate already here? You don't think there's something to be excited about what's going on here already? If you think there's not, let me share it with you. Because <laughs> if you don't know, you should about all the work that's being done in Mexico. Where we've literally gone down to the San Quentin Valley and we are looking to change the culture down there. Like it's a 100% rape culture down there. Like basically if you're over the age of 18 and you're a girl, it's almost a guarantee that you're gonna be raped at some point, at some point in your life. That's a fact, that's a statistic. We've gone down there and said, no. That is not gonna be the reality down there anymore. No, because we come down with Jesus and we come down with love and we come down with resources, that's how it goes. And we're looking to change the actual culture and people's lives that are down there. If you want to know more about that, talk to Rick. I'm delegating. Talk to Rick. Because he does amazing stuff. As you guys know, we just talked about all the serve the city stuff. That again, I checked with Rick this morning. I'm thinking it was like, again, I'm new, right? So I'm like, oh, 17 years. We've been at this a while. Rick's like, no, bro. It's been like nine years. And I was like, what? Nine years? And we've already gone from a local church like serve the city. to Now it is a city-wide event. Like, come on, like, that's amazing. This isn't just something that's recognized by us and we're like, yeah, we look forward to this. No, the city knows about it. Like, non, I mean, non-Christian organizations who are the one that put us up for the award, like, they know about it. Guys, we're making noise. We are, we're making noise. Even, okay, I gotta say this really well. Because we just opened a new campus up the peninsula. That is exciting because you know what? We're not closing doors, we're opening them. The church isn't dead. We're not closing doors, we're opening them. I'm gonna keep going until somebody helps me. We're not, we're not closing doors, we're opening them. And that's amazing. Again, God is on the move. God is on the move. But my question for you tonight is do you receive that? Do you, do you receive that? Or are you quick to become a skeptic? Because we live in a skeptical world. We live in a culture of skepticism, and it's like, well, you know, those crazy guys on the internet, they can basically just type numbers in, hit enter, and it's out there. I mean, it doesn't have to have any facts whatsoever. Boom, skeptic. Now all of a sudden, all that awesome stuff, you're like, man, God, now it's like, oh, wait. 
There's doubt now. There's doubt now. Because you know what? <laughs> People, we live in a culture and we're here because of broken promises. So what has culture told us? That we can't trust anything that anybody says. Watch any campaign trail, even the guy who wins broken promises. All through it, broken promises. And so what does that teach us? We're like, well, we can't trust God's word because we can't trust anything else around us. And if everything else around us tells me anything about God's word, it means I can't trust it. I can't look at it at face value and go, yes, I can't do it. I've got to be a skeptic because this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense. Even though I took that, that, that out of context and don't have any real understanding of like what it's even saying in the first place, but it doesn't make sense to me. And so uh, I don't believe it. I don't believe that Jesus actually told us to stand up for the poor and the oppressed. I don't believe that we're called to make disciples. I, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. No. A and, we, and we approach everything like this as a skeptic. But see, <laughs> when the church was starting out, all the way back in Acts, right after Pentecost, right after the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles in the upper room, after Jesus had left and he's basically saying, okay guys, I'm ready to use the church. I'm ready to use the church to grow this message. Right, Jesus said it was better for him to go so that he could send a helper to grow the church so that people could know the love and know the gospel message. But what did Peter have? He didn't have big buildings, not yet. He didn't have crazy like worship experiences that drew people into the throne room with lights and lasers and fog machines and it was, not yet. They didn't have that yet. What does he have? What does Peter have? He's got the word of God. That's it. He's got the gospel message. That's it. He had the word of God and a crowd of people. That's all he had. That's all he had. Now, before we start getting arguing about like, oh, well, I think we should meet in house churches. Oh, I think we should play this kind of music. Or like, when we, before we start going preferences, okay, I'm just gonna go, go ahead and just say this because Steve's already said it, so I felt comfortable saying it again. We are gonna do whatever it takes to make sure the gospel message is heard by this city and this island and this country and this world. We're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure that that happens. I don't care if we have to meet in house churches. If we gotta meet in house churches, we gotta meet in house churches. If we gotta like fill massive like arenas where we have to like rent out the Save On Food Arena every single week because we had so many people come to know Jesus, if that's what we gotta do, we're gonna do it. I don't care what it is. There's no right or wrong about where we meet. We gotta do whatever it takes to reach people for the gospel right where we are. Whatever that is, that's what we're gonna do. Because in Acts chapter two, this is people's response. Okay, so what Peter does is he receives the Holy Spirit, he's given the gift, and then he delivers a sermon, his first sermon. And what does he do? You're like, oh, well, let's talk on something really flowery and like, you would know, like make sure they feel really good about themselves. No, he goes for the jugular and is like, hey guys, you know Jesus? You know that guy that you like, you know, dragged through the city and crucified on a cross and beat and buried him or whatever? Well, guess what? He's no longer dead. He's alive. Joke's on you. But guess what? Now we have to go back and we have to ask for that forgiveness because that's what mattered in the first place. It's not about the law. It's not about doing stuff to get up to heaven. It's about following this guy that you crucified. Again, talking right to him, going for the jugular. Not a smart move, but hey, it paid off. Like, why not? And what's the response? What's the response? Acts chapter 2, 37 through 41 says this. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? So it shows two things. It shows humility, and it shows an actual response. Humility and an actual response. Because when they receive God's word, it creates something in them. When, when they receive God's word, no longer is there something like in the way. When they receive it, there's two things, humility and actual response. Then continuing forward, Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive, everybody say receive. receive. Oh, come on, everybody say receive. I know, there's, I know there's stuff going on in the background, but stick with me here, because I can see out of the corner of my eye, I don't think I'm that dumb, okay? But stick with me. Everybody say receive one more time. 
There we go, because we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can receive things from God, and that's okay. God is not a stingy God. He wants to give you things. He wants you to receive the gifts that he wants to give you. He's not a stingy guy. He's not looking to hold it all for himself. He wants to give it away. He wants to give it away to you. I'm not talking about like a brand new Mercedes, which would be nice, but we're not talking about that. No, we're talking about actual gifts that matter in an eternal sense, and he wants to give those away. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That's a whole nother message for a whole nother time. I'm not gonna focus on that because that's a week in itself. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted, everybody say accepted. There we go, we're getting it still. Stay with me, stay with me, stay strong with me. Because when they accepted or when they received his message, what happened? They were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number every single day. And I go back to now, Africa's going, ha, ha, okay, one up, bro. 33,000 every day on average, but good try. That's awesome, because you know what that shows me is that in the beginning, God was working with 3,000. Now today, he's working at the 33,000 level. That's what he does. God doesn't just sit around and just go like, okay, we've kind of coasted. No, God grows and God just blows up our expectations because when we give him our best, he takes it and does immeasurably more than we could ever think or imagine. He takes it and does even more than we could ever think or imagine. Because what's that key word there? Received received, they received God's word and it caused action in their hearts. It caused them to change, it caused them to, to blow up. They couldn't contain it anymore. They went, I can't keep sitting and doing what I've been doing because it isn't working. Are you asking yourself that question today in today's culture? Look at the world around you. Is living for yourself, seeking your own power, seeking your own self, and just trying to build your own kingdom, how is that working for you? How's that working for us? Is it working? No. But, I mean, we can still, we can still ask the question, how's that going? When you receive his word, he can actually do something in your heart. And that's so amazing. So I've got four things to present to you as we, as we wrap up here. Four ideas of how we can begin to receive God's word better. And I gotta, I gotta just tell you, tonight, you guys have blown away my expectations. You, I mean, we're maybe smaller in number, but we're like the 300 Spartans because y'all were louder than all the morning services combined. Like, this was fantastic. Like, it was so good. But as we work on receiving God's word well, here are four things. Number one, posture is important. Okay, posture is important. So go one week, you can use this week if you'd like, but go one week where you're kind of sitting back in your chair, right, just really relax, maybe arms are crossed, I don't know. Super comf, because these are comfy chairs, like you're just like, yeah, I'm here, this is great. And you're just hanging out. You're letting everything kind of just come at you. Let everything come at you. It's like, yeah, this is great. You're trying to absorb as much as possible. What you get, what you get. But then the next week, so maybe next week, hint, next week, Come ready with like your Bible in one hand, a notebook in the other, because God forbid we write anything down in church, but like Bible in one hand, notebook in the other, and we're like on the edge of our seat, and we're ready to receive. We're like, come on, come on. Like, like we're ready to go. Like imagine, and then when you do that, when you have both experiences, tell me which one you remember more. Tell me which one actually caused change in your life more. Just a little challenge, just throwing it out there. So maybe next week, hint, next week, <laughs> we all bring that stuff, we sit on the edge of your chair and we're just like, okay God, what do you got? Because you know what, it doesn't matter if it's me, if it's Steve, if it's some stranger we've never met, they're bringing God's word. And if they're bringing God's word, they take that seriously. So it's not me, like don't get excited for me, get excited for God's word, and that's why we're on the edge of our seat. Yeah. That's because we're ready for it. We're like, yes, come on Jesus, wreck me. Come on, wreck me, like let's go man. Wreck me. Number two, have an open heart. These two things kind of couple together. Have an open heart. Allow God to convict when necessary. 
right? We have to come ready to go as soon as we walk in the door. Okay, so come with an open heart. So as you're, as you're preparing for church, Luke and I have had, since Luke's here, we've had many conversations about this. We shouldn't be ready and waiting to experience God after we've gotten our coffee and we sit down and, you know, the countdown's gone and we're like, oh, this is great. This is, good. This is cool. And we're drinking our coffee. We play a couple songs and it's like, okay, like, and then we approach it with this idea of like, okay, worship team, wow me. Okay, worship team, blow me up. Because I'm, I'm now ready to receive God's word after this song because you just crushed it with that guitar solo. <laughs> like, we approach it like that. We expect to come to church and kind of get into the mode. We should be in the mode as soon as we walk through those doors and we're grabbing coffee, talking to people, and the first song that is played, or we're just like, yes, Jesus, we're ready to go. Why not? Have an open heart. Number three, this one's definitely one of my favorites. I've said this for a long time. Number three is don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid to learn something new. Don't be afraid to be challenged or moved. Don't be afraid to agree with the pastor. Okay? I, I, I don't know if that's a thing or not, but like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be like, whoa, Sunbee, nice job. That was fantastic. Like, Steve-O, you crushed that point, man. Amen. Like, bring it, brother. I mean, are you kidding me? If we started doing that to Steve, Oh my goodness, like he would lose it. It'd be amazing. Because guess what? I guarantee you he would not stop and be like, um, class, let's quiet down. Like, no, son, like Steve would be like, yeah, and he's preaching up here now. He's running down here and he's like, come on, people. Like Steve would be running around like crazy if we let him know that we are with him. Right? If we, if he knew that we were with him as a church, ready to just go, oh, Man, you think of the revival that would happen in this city if that was every Sunday here. Whoo! Imagine that. Oh. Number four. This is my new rule with youth ministry. Speak what is good. Speak what is good. You have a voice in your heart, and all good things come from God. Right? So if you have a good thought, if you have something good to say, say it. I know, mind-blowing. If you think something good, say it. Because you never know what that good word is going to bring to the person you're supposed to say it to. You don't know that if you're supposed to say something good to somebody and you hold it back, how much they need to hear those words of truth and life that you have to bring to them. You don't know how close people are to possibly ending it. That's a reality in our culture. You don't know that. So when you give a good word to somebody, just give it. And if they brush it off like it's no big deal, that's not your fault. Why are you, don't be scared. <laughs> if you think something good, say it. Because words create our reality and words communicate our reality. You guys remember this, this story? I love this story because you know what, words caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down. Like the words, the shout of praise that the Israelites had, that's what made the walls come crumbling down. Yes, God was a part of it, but God was waiting, was waiting for that shout of praise before those walls came down. Because when God enters the scene, when God enters the story, it's not quiet. Why do you think I'm yelling all the time? It's not quiet when we're preaching God's word. It's not quiet when we're receiving God's word. If walls can crumble, cities can be changed. If walls can crumble, cities can be changed. Lives can be changed. Relationships can be changed. They can be fixed, even though they're broken. Guys, God is on the move. And when you're with God, when God is with you, you cannot be scared to let people know that you walk with the God that brings, here we go, Paul, bring us home, buddy, who brings hope to the hopeless, strength to the weak, joy to the oppressed, righteousness to the wanderer, truth to the liar, light into the darkness. I mean, come on. Like, it's ridiculous to think that that's the God that we serve. That's amazing. 
Guys, that, that's the God who brings all of this together and wants to use you and wants to use me to see it accomplished. Start receiving God's word well. Start receiving his word as truth. We try to overcomplicate, that's as simple as it is. Receive his word well. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. We're gonna sing this song. We're gonna close out tonight with a song and I hope and I pray and I ask you, I implore you to begin to receive these words as true. These are straight out of scripture. Receive them as true. The truths are there. Don't be afraid to lift hands. Don't be afraid to just be quiet. Don't be afraid to even sit down if need be. Get in the posture that is right for you and your heart. Let's sing this song together.